it is one that I think, as Leslie mentions, it touches us all in ways that we probably don't recognize uh, that there is a uh, huge input impact of the Ottoman Empire on the peoples of the Americas, on the peoples of Europe, on the peoples of Africa, on the peoples of Asia. And it is not coincidental because, of course, as you know, centered around Constantinople, or what we call Istanbul today, the Ottoman Empire radiated out into Africa, into Asia, and into Europe for uh, 600 years. And that has had a huge impact on virtually every aspect of life as we know it. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to see some of those connections as we go through this history. The other reason that I'm delighted to be here is that the, um, the Middle East is really my area of interest and, and maybe hoped for one day expertise. And as I look at the Middle East, I've always tried to figure out how it got to be, what it is, how it is, how dysfunctional it often is. And I think that many of the antecedents of how all of those 19 or 20 Middle Eastern countries, how many of them are the way they are because of their Ottoman heritage that most of these countries that you're familiar with on the screen are the descendants of what was, in fact, the Ottoman Empire and uh, was carved up in, by various people in various ways over the centuries. Most recently, as uh, Leslie mentioned, in 1922 when the Sultanate was abolished. So we're going to talk about the old days. We're going to talk about the impact we're going to talk about how you can uh, find out more than you're going to get in just an hour or two in August of 2021. There'll be a reading list that follows this talk that you'll get electronically. And because I'm being sponsored today by the UW's Middle East Center, uh, there'll be a short, I promise, short online evaluation of today's presentation takes about two minutes to fill it out. Leslie will send you the link. There's no paper involved. You click on it, you fill it out. In fact, you're welcome to fill it out before the presentation, too, if you like. Uh, my wife is busy at home doing that, too, with many, many of them. Uh, I also am delighted to be here because it gave me the opportunity to learn not so much about Arabia or about uh, the Persian Gulf where I used to live, but to go back in time and try to find out more about the Ottoman Empire. And of course, the first thing I did was go online uh, because the University of Washington's library is still closed. And I pulled up uh, uh, information. And of course, this is what I got. <laughs> You may wonder why we call this an Ottoman, but we call it an Ottoman because it is in fact Ottoman. It comes from that part of the Turkish Empire, and over the centuries, it used to be a two or three-sided bench with cushions all along it where people could sit and talk during a modulus or a gathering point where they're going to discuss uh, big issues for the tribe or the sultanate or the caliphate. Uh, and over the years, those, that bench got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until the Europeans arrived and bring a small, usually square, upholstered footstool with them back to Europe. In fact, Thomas Jefferson has the first Ottoman had the first Ottoman ever brought to the Americas at Monticello. So next time you go there, poke around to see if you can find this. Now, when you get sort of deep into learning the, the history of furniture when you go down this rat hole and you forget the major topic, and then it gets worse because at least one place in America that sells Ottomans is called this. <laughs> Acres. <laughs> 
of different kinds of ottomans spread across a giant mall area, and they have the temerity to call themselves the Ottoman Empire. But we're going to get a little more serious than that together as we look at where we're going to go today and then in a couple weeks when we're finishing. As Leslie says, we're going to let the Ottoman Empire crescendo from about the year 1299 in terms of the amount of space, the amount of impact, the amount of people in the empire until about the year 1700. And then it starts to deteriorate. As Leslie said, the Sultanate uh, is abolished by the, the victorious powers in World War I in 1922. So this is our, our remit today, is to get you up to the sort of pinnacle, the zenith of the Ottoman Empire, and you'll start to see how important they were uh, in so many ways. We'll look about at where the Turks came from. They are not from Turkey, by the way. Uh, they migrated. We'll see how far their peoples came over the years. We'll talk about the Mongol Empire, the Mongol invasion of Western Asia and Eastern Europe. We'll talk about Osman. Let's try to say that, even behind your mask. Osman. Osman. Good. Osman, as you probably remember, was the third caliph after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad dies in 632. Abu Bakr, then Omar, and Uthman was the next uh, caliph of the young Muslim community. Um, but Uthman, of course, is written like this. But this letter, Utha, the Fa, doesn't occur in Turkish. And so they wrote his name Osman. When the Europeans heard about Osman, whose small empire in the Anatolian plateau started to grow, they said, well, there's some Ottoman who is conquering territory to the east and the west and the north and the south. And we're going to start to call this the Ottoman Empire, which is a kind of bastardization, if I may, of Othman, which is a variation on the Arabic name, Othman. So this is where we get the word Ottoman. We come by it naturally. One of the things we're going to focus on a little bit today is how in the world could a, an empire that was largely built by conquest be as successful as, as it was, how long-lasting it was, how much territory it covered. And uh, one of the reasons was the millet system. And the millet system, we'll get into it in more detail, but it involved allowing conquered peoples to essentially rule themselves. The Ottomans had a kind of a philosophical talent for saying, well, if you believe a certain way, if you are Christians, if you are Jews, if you are Yazidis, if, who knows whether you're Sunni or Shiite, if you're Muslim, we don't care. What we care about, after we conquer you, usually by force, is that you pay your taxes. As long as you pay your taxes, you can have your own family law courts, you can make your own decisions about property uh, conflict where somebody is suing somebody else in a different kind of a legal system. So there were Jewish legal courts, there were Christian legal courts, there were uh, uh, Assyrian legal courts, all within the Ottoman Empire. And so part of the success they had was being a, in a kind of a hands-off kind of a way, but still in charge. 
early on in their expansion, the Ottoman Empire was actually more Christian than it was Muslim. Even though Uthman was Osman, was himself a Muslim leader of his tribe, he started conquering first to the west and absorbing all kinds of Greek Orthodox folk who had been a part of the Byzantine Empire in western Turkey and then into the Balkans and then all the way up to the gates of Vienna. So for many years, maybe as many as two centuries of the six centuries that they lasted, the Ottoman Empire was in fact a Christian empire in majority terms rather than a Muslim empire. It was an age of empire, and we're going to talk about this a lot today and in a couple weeks, because the empires are always jockeying for uh, control, control of resources in most cases, control of trade routes, control of, uh, of uh, important strategic areas, places like Istanbul, right on the, the Dardanelles separating Asia from Europe. So the, the, the British Empire, the Mongol Empire, the Mughal Empire, the Safavid Empire, with Persians, were always pushing and pulling against each other. And so it was really the age of empire. World War I pretty much ended the age of empire. And that's when you start to see the German Empire dissolves, the Austro-Hungarian Empire dissolves, the o Ottoman Empire dissolves, the Russian Empire dissolves and becomes the Soviet Union. So um, it is an age of empire, and I'm going to reinforce that point several times today. Ah, one of the people right at the pinnacle uh, of, of expansion and of success and of progress in all sorts of ways was one of the most famous sultans of the Ottoman Empire, a man named Suleiman the Magnificent. And Suleiman the Magnificent was also known as the Qanuni. You actually know this Arabic word. One of the highest forms of praise in Islam is to be a lawgiver. There are only three in uh, pre-Islamic uh, uh, pre period before the seventh century. The first was Moses, the second was Jesus, and the third was Muhammad. But Suleiman the Magnificent is given this honorific term, Kanuni, the lawgiver. Kanuni. Kanuni. That's the wrong letter. You know this word. It's come down to English. It's the same word as canon. C A N O N as a body of laws, a body of literature. So uh, Suleiman the Magnificent is known by this honorific term among Turks that was reserved for the great, the luminaries of Islam. Hamid the, the second uh, was the man who, and we're going to get more into the details, but was the Sultan who, um, expands the, the Ottoman Empire to include three important places. And those three important places include Istanbul. We'll talk about whatever kinds of questions you have uh, while, uh, when the going uh, gets uh, toward the end of today, whatever kinds of questions you have, we'll try to answer them. So that's our roadmap for where we're going. We talked about the Ottomans, who they are, uh, and uh, how they got that, that name from their, the head of their dynasty, Osman I. Empire and nation and state are all going to be terms that we use every day, 
but I'm not sure that we always take a minute to try to unpack them, what to see what they actually mean. Empires are usually headed by an emperor, emperor or an empress. Uh, Catherine the Great comes to mind. Um, and uh, it doesn't, however, mean that they necessarily are authoritarian in their uh, the uh, management of the affairs of the state, uh, but it usually does. Empires have been uh, ebbing and flowing since time began, as I mentioned earlier. Nations, in the political science sense, a nation is actually a, an ethnic term, a group of people that share some ethnicity or religious uh, uh, conviction or a place that gives them a kind of a uh, unique and identifiable culture. So when you hear the term nation, it really refers to a group of people. A great example of this in today's world are the Kurdish. Kurdish peoples are a nation of people. Uh, and uh, that, well, however, as we all know, the Kurdish people don't have a state. So when you hear about a nation state, it's probably one of those constructs where the actual is a homogeneous group that has its own governmental structure and that is more or less a, um, a uniform kind of society. But the whole experience of empire is that you steamroll over all of these nations, but that they don't necessarily become states until later on in this discussion, when so many of those Middle Eastern countries and the European countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, gain statehood. So we're going to use those terms throughout our time together. Sultanka is an Arabic word that comes, uh, means authority or power. Uh, the, uh, the Turkish uh, leaders were originally called Beys, B-E-Y. Uh, they were often referred to by nicknames that we'll see uh, how important those are. But they then, when Osman started to really be successful in expanding his empire, he thought borrowing a very uh, exalted term, Sultan, uh, would be the right way to uh, have uh, the, the recognition that he thought he deserved. In the beginning, however, it wasn't one. Uh, it wasn't a caliphate. It wasn't a, uh, a a religious organization headed by a khalifa or caliph. Khalifa is the Arabic word for successor, successor to the prophet Muhammad. Um, the caliphate wasn't declared by the Turks in the Ottoman Empire until Selim the first or second. I've forgotten which. Uh, and he's the one who actually takes control of Jerusalem and Mecca and Medina. And at that point, during the rise of the Ottoman Empire, they uh, pull onto themselves the mantle of the caliphate, and uh, the sultan takes the, the name leader of the faithful, which is uh, the caliph's official title. Pasha is a, is a Turkish word. It's a Persian word. You'll see it particularly as we get later in the Ottoman experience when we get into the 20th century. You may have heard of a period of the three Pashas, Enver Pasha, Talat Pasha, and Jamal Tat Pasha, who are the three Pashas that sort of usher out uh, the Sultanate in the early 20th century. We're going to talk a lot about them. It's an honorific term that probably comes from the Persian word padishah, or great king. You're learning more than you thought you even, we even wanted to know. Uh, vazir, all these terms are terms that we know. We've heard these. Vazir is a Turkish variant on wazir, which is uh, the um, a minister in the secretary sense. The minister of war is Wazir al-Harb. So the, the person who is in charge of a certain aspect of the government is a, a wazir in many Arabic countries and also in the Ottoman Empire. 
And the Grand Vizier was the one who had the highest position who uh, informed and uh, did the bidding of the Sultan. One of the other reasons why the Ottoman Empire was so successful is that the sultans from a very early era, uh, after the beginning of the dynasty, started kidnapping Christian children, mostly boys, and they brought those boys back to the Ottoman territories and converted them to Islam and started to train them to be the shock troops, the sultans uh, palace guard in a way, and they would always be there and they would be completely loyal to, uh, to the Sultan. These were called the Janissaries. Janissary is a Turkish word meaning new troops. They were the new parts of the army and they play an absolutely critical role at different times when the Ottoman Empire is under threat. They also had a tendency to revolt and causing uh, this or that sultan great grief. We've talked about the millet system and how important it was to sort of keep those conquered peoples satisfied, or at least content, over the many, many centuries. And this was quite a distinction for the Ottoman Empire, because if you had, if you had a village that fell into the Byzantine Empire, You've got all kinds of woe from them if your catechism wasn't quite right, if your trinity wasn't quite in the right direction, if you thought Jesus had both uh, godly and manly qualities. They came down on you like a ton of bricks. They were orthodox. There was only one way to think. The Ottomans, on the other hand, allowed all kinds of very uh, lifestyle, legal systems, at least as far as, as family law and property law were concerned, and the, what was the essence of your religious faith. Again, I think that was probably one of the uh, reasons they were so successful. This is impossible to see and read, but I really demonstrate nothing more than this yellow line at the bottom. The empire grows around the beginning of about 1300 and grows until about 1700 when it starts to disintegrate uh, slowly uh, to the point that Nicholas I, the Russian Tsar, referred to Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, as the sick man of Europe. The sick man of Europe. Interesting that he didn't say the sick man of Asia or the sick man of the Middle East, or the sick man of Africa, but the sick man of Europe. So the Ottomans were really thought to be a, uh, a, a, a Southeast European people. We'll get back to all of this, but you don't have to remember any of it. When I talk about empire, I just want to remind us that empire is the That's where we, as human beings, as homo sapiens, we've mostly lived either as hunter-gatherers for tens and tens and thousands of years, but also for, uh, it, when we started to cluster together, we lived as part of somebody's empire, usually not our own. And this was the standard way that people organized their, their way of life, their commerce, their governance uh, for, uh, for centuries. Uh, Alexander the Great, as you can see, uh, in the fourth uh, century before the Common Era, creates a massive empire, mostly through conquest. Leslie mentioned the Roman Empire at its height includes virtually all of the Mediterranean. Remember what the Romans called the Mediterranean? Mare Nostrum, our sea. And you can see why they did that. It was the thing that really linked all of the empire together. The Ottomans take most of it eventually. The Umayyad Empire, one of the uh, religious empires of the Islamic era, uh, 
uh, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, the Umayyads expand into territory that was once Persian, was once Byzantine, once was part of the Roman Empire, all the way up to southern France. They controlled all of this territory, but not the northern part of the Mediterranean. The Seljuk Turks, this is where the Turks come into play for the first time. The Turks actually come from northeastern Asia, and we'll see uh, how they get all the way across Asia and onto the Anatolian Plateau over the centuries. But again, be thinking about empire was the norm. The sun never did set on the British Empire, it turns out. They were everywhere. You also may remember from your, your high school history books that at some point around the year 1000, the western and eastern halves of Christendom split. One half goes east, one half goes west, and Byzantium, right here, what becomes Constantinople, uh, what becomes uh, Istanbul eventually, uh, is the seat of the Byzantine Empire. But the, the mother of all empires were the Mongols. They controlled maybe not more people than the British Empire did at its height, but they controlled more territory from the Pacific Ocean on this side of Asia all the way across uh, uh, the Central Asia and into not only the Anatolian Plateau, but also all the way they too uh, sacked or attempted to sack uh, Vienna in what is today Austria. I couldn't help but think about the night before Christmas, when I thought about how it was that the Turks were sort of pushed like leaves before a hurricane flying, and they were pushed all the way across Asia over about a century and a half by the Mongol invasion. The Mongols either used them as shock troops, conquered peoples, or hired them to be their best cavalry uh, troops. The Turks were extraordinarily good horsemen and women, and they could fire a very short bow with extraordinary accuracy. And as the Mongols were moving under Genghis Khan, eventually under Kublai Khan, are moving across Asia and into Europe, they're pushing the Turks ahead of them, and the Turks are kind of sort of junior Mongols in a way, as they also start to conquer the peoples that they encounter. And it is this way that brought all of the Turks from way up in the northeast of Europe. Do I have this slide? Surely I do. The Turks probably originate right here. And over the centuries, they migrate ahead of the Mongols all the way down to what we call Turkey today. But when you think about that extraordinary migration over a relatively short period of time and with tremendous conquest success of both the Mongols and the Turks, this is how the Turkey today is full, almost 88% full of Turks. You might notice a couple of things about the Altaic language family being a little budding linguist, I like to think about this stuff. But look at what languages Turkish is closest to. Japanese and Korean. Same kind of grammatical structure, many of the same roots, Mongolian, Turkic, Japanese, and Korean. Interesting. As the westward expansion of Turks ahead of the Mongols continues, guess what they bump into? 
these guys, who are, have complete control over the Anatolian Peninsula, and the Turks push them out, 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 back into Europe, across the Bosphorus into Europe, and eventually, by capturing Constantinople in 1453 of the Common Era, they end the Byzantine Empire. So it's a constant struggle. You may look at this word and wonder why they call themselves Romans. The Byzantines also called their empire the Roman Empire. So when the Seljuk Turks took this territory, they said, well, they used to be the Roman Empire. Now we're the Roman Empire. And many of the sultans of the Ottoman dynasties referred to themselves not only as sultan, later as caliph, but also as the Roman emperor. Interesting. You may, may have heard about a, a Sufi poet named Rumi uh, from the 13th century. He comes from Rum. This is where his territory was. And that's why he's called, essentially, a Roman. So much to learn. Eventually, the Turks are the only people on the Anatolian Peninsula. They've squeezed out virtually everybody else, importantly, including the Armenians. Right down here was a traditional homeland for the Armenians, who were, even in the 11th and 12th century, who were forced to flee from the Anatolian Peninsula. We'll find out in a couple of weeks the sad, tragic, um, bitter, history of the Armenian people at the hands of the Turks in 1915, uh, when so many of them died during forced marches. Just so that you don't get bored, um, I thought some fireworks would be in order. Uh, while all these empires are ebbing and flowing across the planet, along come the Chinese with an invention that might be used by some of these empires to be more efficient in their conquests, and it's gunpowder. And gunpowder in the ninth century is invented, and one historian has called it the commodity of empire. Now, pop quiz time. Question number one. What are the component parts of this gunpowder that the Chinese invented? Sulfur. 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 Charcoal. Saltpeter. Charcoal and saltpeter. Salt the other name for saltpeter is potassium nitrate. And good. So the Chinese monks in the 19th, the 9th century are, are trying to find an elixir for eternal life. And they mix saltpeter together with charcoal, together with sulfur, and they drink it. This is one of the great ironies of history. The thing that kills more people in the last 1,500 years is the thing that they were trying to find some way to extend their lives rather than shorten them. Okay? Now, I won't ask you about the ratio of all those parts, but here's the second and final question on your pop quiz. Turkey. No, I wish it were Turkey for today's talk, but think about empire. It's India. Has more potassium nitrate than any other place on Earth. And all of a sudden, the Portuguese are interested, the British are interested, the Mongols are interested, the Persians are interested, the Seljuk Turks are interested. Everybody's trying to get their hands on India. Another thing happens that bears on our discussion of the Ottoman expansion to the West, and that is something called the Crusades. You've heard about them. There were six, uh, formally six Crusades, 
uh, that started in about the year 1096 by Pope Urban II, who decided that it was time to wrest control of Jerusalem back from the Saracens, back from the Muslims. And he uh, initiated a series of crusades that were going off to the Holy Land to recapture the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, okay? The only problem with the Fourth Crusade, does anybody know what the problem with the Fourth Crusade was? They never made it to Jerusalem. And they said, wow, there's a beautiful city right over there. Why don't we go and sack Constantinople? Well, it was a Christian city. It was the seat of the Eastern Orthodox Church of the Byzantine Empire. And in 1204, the crusaders from Western Europe, the Latin crusaders, the Frankish crusaders, sack Constantinople and uh, virtually ruin it as a uh, administrative city for this empire. The Turks, remember, are just sitting right across the Dardanelles from Istanbul, what, they, what becomes Istanbul, Constantinople, and are waiting for somebody to soften them up. And in, in their fondest dreams they couldn't think of, a better group than a bunch of marauding crusaders coming from Western Europe who sack Constantinople. It isn't very long before the Turks themselves start to make inroads at capturing that city. The other thing I like about the Ottoman Empire is that they had the best hats <laughs> of any human beings since time began. And I was in Kyrgyzstan once in Bishkek when it was still part of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was, of course, Central Asian, full of Turks. They spoke a Turkic language. Uh, Kyrgyz is Turkish. And uh, at the, my last day there, I said to my hosts, you know, I really wish I had one of these hats. Do you still, does anybody still have these? And they said, well, they're not quite that spectacular, but we'd like to give you one. <laughs> this is called kalpak in Turkish, and it's a fine, very soft, very warm wool that comes from the, the, the goats and the camels and the sheep in that region, and it is um, a throwback to this period in the Ottoman Empire, and Kyrgyz people still wear them with great pride. It's kind of a ceremonial hat now. I was one time on a cold winter's night in Seattle, um, getting dressed to go to my daughter's soccer game when she was about 10. And I thought, well, I know this is a little out of the ordinary, but I think it's so cold that I'm going to wear my cold fuck. And I had a big long coat, and um, I was wearing my kolpak by the sidelines, and one of my daughter's teammates was dribbling the ball down the sidelines, and she stopped dead in her tracks in front of me and said, excuse me, Mr. Lincoln. <laughs> this is a true story that connects me to the Ottoman Empire. We're going to look at four different sultans. Uh, Osman, the, the dynastic head, uh, who reigned at the end of the 13th century. We'll look at Mehmed II, the conqueror who increased the territory of the, um, of the empire. Selim I was the grim, Yavuz, they called him. Nobody even used his name. They simply said Yavuz. And everybody knew that there was this dour guy who was the sultan uh, at the time. But he was, as it says there on the screen, the one who <coughs> took on the title, the first title, of caliph uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And finally, we'll look at uh, not only the best hat of them all, but Suleiman the Magnificent, who was the, um, really represented the best, the brightest, the most successful of all the sultans of the Ottoman Empire's six centuries of existence.
But to give you a sense of place, the Ottomans are on uh, a, a Mount Osman and his small tribe are on the Anatolian Plateau, along with all kinds of other different tribes of Turks. And at the end of, um, of the 13th century, his idea is that he needs to start expanding his territory, because there's one truism for empires, and that is grow. grow. As soon as you stop growing, guess what happens? The, the things fall apart, the center cannot hold, you lose control over the outbound. It happened to the Romans, it happened to the Greeks, it happened to the, the British. For goodness sakes, they lost, uh, you know, all parts of the empire. Uh, it had expanded beyond um, its ability to maintain itself. But in the early days, the Ottomans thought they needed to grow. And so they start to grow. According to legend, they start to grow because Osman has a dream one night. And he dreams that coming out of his abdomen in his sleep is a tree, and he can see all the different peoples of Asia and Africa and Europe on this tree. And he thinks this is a sign from God, from Allah, that I should expand my empire to include all of these people. And on your reading list that you'll get later uh, today or tomorrow is a wonderful, uh, longish uh, history of the, the Ottoman Empire called Osman's Dream. And it has that same uh, notion of Osman's uh, sense that he's got like uh, President Monroe had a uh, kind of a manifest destiny to expand his empire. So if we had to talk about sometimes the empire doesn't have an emperor, I'm thinking about American history a little bit too. But this is my favorite picture of Osman's dream because it's a picture of all the sultans from Osman up to the final one in 1922. And it it not only um, has each of them on there, but you'll notice something as you get to this top couple of rows. The hats change. So you thought I was just being frivolous to bring my hat today. But in fact, the hat is an emblem of the ch manifest changes in the Ottoman Empire all the way from Osman in the beginning through Kemal Ataturk in the 1920s. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. So the, the empire rose. First to the east, he's conquering, he's conquering other Seljuk Turks at this point. And then he goes around the outside of of, uh, of Constantinople and starts to control parts of southern Europe, what is today Bulgaria, Albania, Greece, Yugoslavia, Serbia, uh, Kosovo, Montenegro, all of those constituent republics, Romania, and the Ottoman are extraordinarily successful in capturing these territories from the weakened Byzantine Empire, weakened in many cases thanks to not only the schism with the western part of Christian Christendom, but also the crusade sacking of Constantinople. As you can see, that territory starts to grow and gets considerably larger. And at this point in the imperial growth, it is still majority Christian rather than majority Muslim. Not a very good picture, but it gives you a sense of, of uh, where it's going. I lived in Yugoslavia, which is about right, was about right there before it broke up. And I stayed in a village in uh, the southern part of Serbia that had been sick in six different parts of its history had been in a different empire. They'd been part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. They'd been a part of the Ottoman Empire. Then they went back to the Austro-Hungarians. Then they went back to um, the Ottomans. Six different times in their history. 
you can start to see that North Africa comes into play here as well. Because this is also becoming part of the Ottoman Empire. And soon, they're controlling much of the Eastern Mediterranean. And eventually, all the way down to Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula, down here, and all the way to the, through the Persian Gulf, where I used to live, right there. I used to live somewhere all, for all of my talks. Um, and uh, they had control over, importantly, they had maritime control over all of these trade routes. It, back in those days, it was spices, it was slaves, but it was pretty much everything that passed through anywhere had to pass through Ottoman lands. This, of course, did not please the British, the Portuguese, the French, and the Spanish, who also had maritime empires. Eventually, the Ottoman Empire gets to be uh, a considerable collection of nations, different peoples, different languages, different backgrounds, uh, and, uh, but a, a force to be reckoned with among all the empires of the world. This is, if you, you could teach a course and just have this be your only screen, because you could look down at the growth of the empire in those color-coordinated uh, sections of the map. Let's go quickly. I don't have a clock. Tell me when I've gone too long. Uh, let's go quickly and look at Osman. He founds the dynasty. He uh, expands the territory. It's largely Christian, but he was apparently just brilliant. He could tell when he came up to a fortified piece of territory, like a city, he could tell whether it was breachable or whether he had to besiege it. And the Ottomans were masters at sieges. And in most cases, they simply starved the city uh, uh, over months and months and months. But tens of thousands of Ottoman troops are following along and helping Osman expand his empire. Not yet the Janissaries, but they come pretty soon. You can read as well as I can. It was Mehmet who uh, captures Constantinople in 1453 and, and connects Instead of having this section of the Byzantine Empire between parts of the Ottoman Empire, now he's got complete control over that bridge between Asia and Europe. Each of these uh, men uh, has a, a really interesting story. And uh, Carolyn Finkel's book goes into great detail about uh, each of their lives. Could you tell why he was called the Grim? <laughs> and then finally, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Because of the expansion of the empire, this happened to the Romans, this happened to the Greeks, this happened to the Russians, for goodness sakes. They were able to consolidate tremendous wealth in the center, in St. Petersburg, or in Rome, or in Athens. And then there was this flourishing of art, architecture, uh, philosophy, uh, science, medicine, uh, astronomy, in all of these empires were able to consolidate resources from the benighted people out in the, the reaches of the empire and really do something with it. So I, I suspect that many of you have been to Istanbul. How many have you? Have? Amazing, amazing. Um, You've seen the extraordinary architecture of that city and uh, Topkapi Palace, uh, the, the, the mosques that were built, many of which were built under Suleiman the Magnificent's reign. But he did one more thing that's really critical. And maybe it could have been the start of the end. You see what it says right there? Until Suleiman the Magnificent, in the 5th, 16th century, no sultan married. Not one. 
They had a harem where there were slaves who were there to provide male issue for his sultanhood, his, his, his uh, kingship. And as soon as they bore him a son, each of those slaves was then retired to the harem. And so each of the sons of the sultans before Suleiman had his own mother, every one of them. Along comes Suleiman the Magnificent. He's tremendously successful. He may have gotten sort of a big head, and, and he spies Roxalana. Roxalana is a slave girl, and uh, she's born him not only one son, but eventually goes on to bear him eight children. And he marries Roxalana, the first sultan to do that. Uh, and against all the advice of his wazirs, vizirs, and his army and the Janissaries, he creates a, um, a family unit that is different from all of his predecessors. So interesting. How did Suleiman the Magnificent, you may ask, control the trade routes around the Mediterranean? The answer is pirates. He hired two of the most famous pirates of the century that he called corsairs, which is a kind of a sanitized version of pirate. And uh, one of them is a name you recognize. Barbarossa would control all of the Ottoman shipping lanes in the eastern Mediterranean. And what you'll learn next might surprise you. The most successful pirate in the Western Mediterranean in the 16th century was a woman. Sayyida al hurra literally Mrs. Freedom. But it meant Mrs. Freedom for the Ottoman ships, not the Portuguese, not the Spanish, not the French, not the British, only for the Ottomans. And so it was probably one of the reasons that the Ottoman Empire was so successful in the 16th century. They had the best pirates. Barbarossa actually means red beard in Italian. But by the time he had this uh, etching done, uh, he had, like many of us, gone gray. So this is the empire at its height. An extraordinary, unique, political, social, economic, military construct, I think, in the history of empires for all kinds of unique and different reasons. It doesn't mean that it's going to last forever. The original name for the Ottoman Empire was the, uh, the, Ottoman, the sublime Ottoman Empire and eventually it became the eternal Ottoman Empire. But the eternal Ottoman Empire, as we all know, like all empires, doesn't last. We've talked about what it's, it's the reasons it was successful. One of them just happens to be a, a geologic. At this point, where so much of the world's trade from Asia, from Europe, from Africa, passes through this point, and with the eventual control of Constantinople by the Ottomans, they were in control of much of the economic uh, life of all of Europe, much of Asia, and everything that was coming from Africa and India, including Salt Peter. How we get from this massive uh, empire with so many different kinds of people in it, and have it reduced down like a fine sauce to just turkey is the stuff of our conversation in two weeks' time.